Senator Lambert Brown gave touching testimony and confession after return from the dead. Bless up to my viewers and my subscribers. Them. I hope everybody having a blessed and a wonderful evening. Now, my viewers and my subscribers, remember, in everything you do, always put God first. In every or uh, any situation, just always remember to call upon God. Always remember to pray because a prayer day keep the devil away. Now, my viewers and my subscribers, Senator Lambert Brown give a touching testimony after returning from the dead. The man give a confession. The man explain to you. The man make you know say you never did have to see him. Which part him there right now because of what he have been through. Because of the road that he went down, my people. You understand? And the man make you know say you have to be grateful for life because him never have to which part him there. I give him testimony right now because him go up on the road of death. And that is why we have to be grateful for life. We definitely have to be grateful for life. And that is why we have to continue to thank God for life itself. You understand what I say? Because some of we don't remember if we thank God for life. And he is the kings of all kings. He is the creator. But people... Before we get into this video, I would appreciate if you all would leave a like on this video. Please give this video a thumbs up. Also, if you are new viewers, first time on my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and turn on the post notification bell. So whenever we drop new content, you will be first to be notified. Share the content and leave your opinion down below in the comment section. Make a jump straight into it. I will recall, Mr. President, in January 2012, that along with Senator Navel Clark, that Senator Floyd Morris and myself are the only remaining members of the Senate sworn in in January 2012. And Senator Clark assured me that he was going to be here this morning for this. And I thank you, my friend and brother, for your presence. Mr. President, on your side, on the government side now, there are three of the 21 senators who were sworn in in 2012 that remain. Yourself, Minister Johnson, my new bestie, and Senator Kavan Gale. So, in those 12 years, we have had numerous interactions. We have agreed and disagreed on issues. And there's nothing personal in our agreements or disagreements. We all thought that in one way or another, we could best serve the nation's interests. And so, I want to thank former Prime Minister Portia Lucretia Simpson Miller for her courage and some would say wisdom, others would say imprudence in appointing me, recommending my appointment to the Senate. She did it when I sat on that side and she did it when there were only eight of us sitting on this side. I also want to thank former opposition leader, Dr. Peter Phillips, for his confidence in making my third appointment to the Senate. And I thank Peter, former student of JC, can't leave that out, and a man who has trod the earth. I thank you, Pedro. I thank also the current leader of the opposition, Mark Jefferson Golden, who counsel, who has sought my counsel along the way, and who has indicated to me that he still wants me to play a role in the preparation he's making 
to become the next Prime Minister of Jamaica. As, Doc, as Peter Bunting would say, Senator Bunting would say, time come. time come. So, President, I want to thank the Almighty for allowing me to be alive today. I can testify that his steadfast love never ceases and new mercies are granted every day. So President, and, it, and let me just say this here. This is likely to be my penultimate. Matthew, some more than that here. Senator, some more than that here. It's likely to be my penultimate, or very well, my ultimate State of the Nation presentation. I'm conscious, President, that age and health has put me in the winter of my public service. So I am ready to move on whenever that time come for me to move on. And there's life, there's life post-Senate as Senator Navel Clark shows. So I don't want headlines to say I've resigned. Nor do I want it to say Senator Brown says time come for him. We don't want that either. Time come. Time come. So, President, allow me in this presentation to be a little personal. On the 18th of September, I underwent a major operation. I was hospitalized for two weeks. Since then, I'm slowly recovering, and hopefully one day I'll be back to full strength. So, President, I owe more than a debt of gratitude to some people for their role in my presence here today. I came pretty close to not seeing you guys at my funeral. The doctors missed the fact that my appendix, appendix had, that my appendix had ruptured and it had been so for more than a week and that the negative effect of that had begun to set in. I wish to thank personally as I've done and so many times my colleague Senator Donna Scott Motley. I want to thank also my colleague, Senator Sophia Fraser Bins. And the word I've chosen in the presentation is for conspiring. No conspiracy has an illegal element to it. But there's nothing illegal in the collaboration that they did with my daughter. But for me, Good and bad conspiracy. They collaborated behind my stubbornness to have Dr. Jeff Leibert, who is the husband of Senator Fraser Bean, review my medical record. After I was told I needed to be admitted to the hospital, but there was no bed available. Not because I didn't have money to pay for a bed. There's no bed available in the private hospital. And the only place that would take me was the University of the West Indies. They took me in the Tuesday. And they discharged Tuesday late, about 1, 1 a.m., and they discharged me by 6 a.m. the Wednesday morning. I thought I was fine. I went home, struggling, but home and happy. But on the 18th, on the 17th of September, the Sunday, it's a PNP conference. I was at home. I got a call that I thought was coming from Senator Fraser Bins, 
because it was her phone number that called. So I said, are you at conference already? But the person on the phone said, no, Lamy, this is not Sophia. This is Jeff. That's her husband. He said, Lamy, I have looked at your record following the conspiracy between them. And you should not be at home. You need to be in the hospital now. He added that he had made arrangements for a bed for me and I should go immediately to the hospital. I am alive today, thanks to him and his intervention. I want also to thank Dr. Baker, who facil facilitated the admission to the hospital. And there's a man who I looked up after he caught me deep and asked him, why are you in Jamaica? Give me your skills, give me all of that. And he gave me a reason that made me proud of a patriot called Dr. Lucian Tomlinson. He walked into my room at Andrews Memorial Hospital, having been admitted on Sunday the 17th. He walked in on the 18th. And I am meeting him for the first time. And he said to me, you get the news? I'm wondering as a politician, trade unionist, what news is he talking about? So I said, what news, doc? He said, I'll just look at your CT scan. Immediate surgery. Um, immediate surgery? And he explained what he saw on the CT scan. This is just about an hour or so after the CT scan was done. And he said, I'm going to check for operating theatre now. He came back, and this is after 5 o'clock, and said, we're going in at 7.30. That's how urgent it was, Mr. President. President, we didn't go in at 7.30. There's difficulty. His deputy, wife, had a birthday that day, and he was out at dinner with his wife. Thankfully, the dinner was cut short, Minister Johnson Smith. I'm sorry, I apologize to the wife, whoever and wherever she may be. But the dinner, the birthday dinner was cut short. He came. The anesthesiologist looked me in the face and said, It must be important why I leave my dinner and come here. But I wasn't sure if I could be important on the gurney. I know they were going in. So I want to thank Dr. Tomlinson's team. <laughs> President, allow me also to thank the management and staff at the hotel now, the Andrews Memorial Hospital. I want to thank the nurses, the nurses who treated me, the nurses who did some personal things that I couldn't do for myself. I want to thank the technical team, CT scan, ultrasound, x-ray. I want to thank the ancillary staff, and more importantly, Central Gale. I want to thank the porters, not only for pushing me in the wheelchair when I could move, but I remember one day, President, that I needed to move from a chair to the bed, and I couldn't do it. So they sent for two strong porters, one on the left, one on the right. And they say after three, one, two, three, 
and they lived, but they had no me. I could not assist them. That was how weak I was. So I want to thank my physiotherapist, who often, as you know, Minister, and my colleagues on this side, I don't refer to her as a physiotherapist. I refer to her as a physioterrorist. <laughs> Dr. Savian Francis, for the tremendous work in restoring strength to muscles that are gone. I want to thank my colleagues in the Senate for your visits, your prayers, and your kind words during my most difficult times. I've said it over and over that in the Senate, on this floor, we debate vigorously. Some people outside take it personally. It isn't. We are friends. We get on long. Minister will not share with them our love letters. <laughs> but suffice it to say, all on that side extended kind words and some visited. One of them who visited will, rec rem will know how much of an impact he had by the opening testimony I made when I said, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, because that was part of the prayer. I want to thank my family and friends, because they were there for me at every moment of my illness. I want to thank my colleagues in the University and Allied Workers Union, who, Senator Gill, have been carrying the load. I train them well, so they allow me to get extended sick leave that is needed. And I thank all of my colleagues at the UAW and in the trade union movement generally. So, President, I want to end this part by saying I got my flowers while I could still smell them. I heard the glowing tributes while I was alive. Unlike the man who dies and people ask, is who I'm talking about? I could hear while I was alive that they were talking about me. It was not a case where the flowers are left where the Dew is on the roses. I could hear the tribute rather than the silence of mourners leaving the graveyard. My day will come to the path, but it has not yet come. Time hasn't come for that yet. So, President, I've indicated to those who have visited me that I have become a strong advocate for ending the policy of turning patients away from hospital because there's no bed. I'm not blaming government on one side or another. The reality is all of us have left our people short, not because resources aren't available, but our vision did not take into account the fact that every man and woman in this country who pays taxes and their family shouldn't be turned away. I want to, President, indicate that during my own illness, I had to reach out to a colleague on the other side because a niece of mine was at Sablamar Hospital for three days on the tough bench because there's no bed available. I reached out to a colleague on that side who assisted in getting attention to her. I recall recently our great football icon, Alan Skilkole. The report said Alan was rushed to the university hospital, but there's no bed. Minister Grange intervened. But that state of the nation 
that leave our people bedless when they are sick is not the best direction for our country. It needs to be changed. And I will be an advocate for that change. The President, in October 2022, I spoke in the State of the Nation debate. Then I described the State of the Nation as one of fear and trepidation. A recent poll conducted by Dan Anderson indicated that nearly 60% of our citizens are living in fear. Imagine the drain that that fear and JLP, PNP, no P, just ordinary citizens, the drain that that fear has emotionally, financially, health-wise, and every otherwise. We have to fix that. It is not a state of the nation that we can be proud of. This is not a good state of the nation. And this is worse, the fear and trepidation. It's worse because I recall the promise of the current prime minister when he was opposition leader. Then he said, you want us to go to bed, sleep with our windows and doors open, and still wake up alive in the morning. In other words, the crime and the murder rate would go down if you voted for his party. He said then, a lot, a lot can be done to cut the murder rates. Those are nice promises. People believe him then. But what is the reality? The president, the murder figures, since I've been a member of the Senate, tells a story where my best years in the Senate relative to murder figures was between 2012 and 2015. The numbers were way lower than any murder numbers since 2016. That's the reality. It was done with less resources available, but done smartly, done with the wisdom of somebody like Peter Bunting as minister. The President, let us be clear, since 2016, 1,354 murders, 14, 1,647, 18, 1,287, 19, 1,339, went up in 2022 to 1,000. 474. The highest figure during those years when Bunting was minister was 1,208. Every year since 2016 have surpassed the ice year under the PNP for 2012-2015. That is a reality. And I know it's Senator up, 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 Fitzhenry. The narrative which says January this year is low and therefore we can expect a low year. But let me re remind you, in 2016, in January, there were 73 murders for the entire month. Yet that year, we had 1,300 plus. So, it's folly to try and extrapolate from what is usually a low murder figure in January to present that for the entire year. And therefore, I urge you when you close, Senator, don't come with that argument. That's a bogus argument. It's as bogus as saying Trump won the 2020 
elections. Because it's really a big lie. So, President, I was tempted, I was tempted in preparing this presentation to simply read into the record a view 